Chapter 21 the, temp the temporary agency was located on the 14th floor of an old downtown office building. The sign on the glass read, Friday's Girls Incorporated. Now that's an original name, Terry remarked as Thomas followed her through the doors. The rating room was nothing special, a small desk with a computer, several poster chairs, and a small coffee table. A mirror behind the desk was carved in the shape of a lady's face and was partially painted to give it a unique artistic flair. The receptionist was a young woman with fire engine red hair and black painted fingernails. Thomas flashed his badge at the new wave generation and asked to see the manager. Without saying a word, she picked up the phone and pushed a few buttons. The feds are here to see ya. She turned to the two agents. Take a seat, please. She was chewing gum intensely. It reminded Thomas of a cow chewing its cud. She picked up a fingernail file and manicured her nails. The girl from the fourth dimension would file a little, then blow on her fingers, then return to chewing her gum. A real classy lady, Thomas thought. They didn't have to wait long before a large, heavyset woman entered and introduced herself as Martha Weatherspoon, the office manager. Call me Marcia, she smiled. We've been expecting you. Come into my office. She turned and headed down the hall. Carrie and Thomas exchanged glances, then followed. They each took a seat in the small, cramped, and very cluttered office. Two dead plants were on the windowsill. Carrie wondered how anyone could deny any living creature or plant the God-given gift of water. Why were you expecting us? Carrie asked. Why not? Martha asked, shrugging. The senator is dead, and one of our girls worked for him. Of course you'd come here sooner or later. Here's her file. I've had it here waiting for you. She handed Thomas a folder with the name Maxine Thornton written on the front. This is too easy, Thomas thought. He opened the folder and found a resume, application, and a sheet listing various assignments and the associated pay rates. The last entry was the deceased senator. You've not reassigned her yet, Thomas asked. Martha gave Thomas an of course not look and said no. Nothing else, no explanation, just a no. Why not, Thomas asked. No particular reason, Martha answered. Where is she now, he asked. Miss Weatherspoon changed abruptly and completely. The pleasant cooperative woman was gone. She answered in a nasty tone and with an ugly attitude. I only place workers. I don't keep track of what they do on their off time. Then she leaned forward aggressively and hissed, and it's none of my business. The odor of her cheap perfume was overwhelming and made him want to leave as soon as possible, but he had a job to do, and he wasn't leaving until he was satisfied. He looked over the file again. Do you know who hired her? There's no point of contact here, just a phone number. He was starting to get irritated. When our work orders come from corporate, Martha said, now with a sarcastic tone, we have no idea as to who ordered it. We simply place a person and then fax in their timesheet once a week. I personally don't care who hires who. She sat back and folded her arms as if to say, I dare you to cross me. Thomas didn't like this woman, but had to ask her a few more questions. Martha answered them with short, obviously rehearsed answers. He finally figured he wouldn't get any more information here, so decided it was time to leave. He asked for a copy of the file, which she gave him with an ill-concealed sneer. Once back in the rental car, Carrie was finally able to read the information from the file. This whole thing stinks, she said. First, a senator has an affair in his house, but he's never brought them home before. Then he's electrocuted in his tub, but he only showers. Next, we find out that a non-existent division of the U.S. government hires a temporary employee, but no one knows why and no one knows who. <sighs> I think I'll dial this number in the file. She punched in the numbers and a phone rang. A recorded voice answered, saying, Please enter your party's extension. Carrie decided to hit zero for operator. 
That is an invalid entry, the recording said. Please enter your party's extension. Carrie tried a few other numbers, but each time received the same recording. Damn, she said in frustration. I keep getting the same stupid lady's voice asking for an extension. Don't worry about it. I'm sure it's a fake number anyway. We'll try to track it down once we're back in D.C., Thomas said without any emotion. Call the airlines and see if you can get us a flight home tonight. Will do, but I still say this whole thing stinks. Carrie didn't like the way the mission was panning out and was anxious to get home. Chapter 22 the morning commute into D.C. was as hectic as ever. What should have been an easy 15-minute drive took Thomas over 40 minutes. Continuous stop and go with angry drivers swerving in and out of traffic, making others break in defense. By the time he parked his car, Thomas was ready to shoot somebody. After the last few days, he wasn't in a very good mood anyway. The halls of the FBI office were crowded, and he had to wait an extra 15 minutes just to reach his floor. By the time he entered his evidence room, Thomas was at his wit's end. Good morning, Mr. Edwards. Carrie was her usual chipper self, but instead of antagonizing him, it actually cheered him up. Okay, he said, let's get to what we have on the board this morning. We need to compare notes. Where are Marzoni and Prowler? Haven't seen them, Agent Owen said. Thomas was worried. He hadn't liked the frantic call he received from Prowler the, uh, the day before, and he'd never heard back from him either. Dr. Thurston entered the room with coffee in hand. Why so gloomy, guys? Have you heard from Marzoni or Prowler? Thomas asked. Saw them yesterday. Why? He asked, munching on a donut and sipping his coffee. They're not here yet, and I'm worried. What time did you see them? Oh, around 8 yesterday morning. Thomas looked at the clock. It was after nine, and he wished his two agents would hurry up and arrive. He told the doctor and Owens about the call from Prowler the day before. Now everyone in the room was concerned for the safety of the missing agents. Each agent placed their evidence on the wall in an attempt to piece together the events of the senator's last days, but no one could quit thinking about Marzonia or Prowler. By noon, Thomas was very concerned. They all made phone calls to try to locate them, but they had not been seen since yesterday, and they had not checked in with the front desk either. It was as if they had disappeared off the face of the earth. At quitting time, Thomas was beside himself. He was sure something terrible had happened to his two agents, and there was nothing he could do tonight, but tomorrow he would personally retrace their steps. When he returned home, Thomas received a pleasant surprise. His parents greeted him at the door. His younger brother, who wasn't so young anymore, was playing video games with Jesse and Kelly. It's just great to have you guys here, Thomas announced after dinner. I really missed you, Mom. Well, you know, Toby, if you'd come home more, you wouldn't miss us as much, Maddie stated. She helped Marlena clear the table. As Thomas and Nate had coffee in the den, and watched the kids play games. How's work, Toby? Nate finally asked. Not real good, Dad. Two of my agents are missing. Missing? Where did you send them, overseas? D.C. Toby held his coffee with both hands and stared into space. You sent two men to D.C. and they haven't come back? I know Washington is a rough town, but it isn't that rough. That's why I'm concerned. People don't just disappear. Nate looked at his son with compassion. Did you check the hospitals? Not yet. We're going to look for them tomorrow. I thought for sure they'd show up today. Besides, we can't just barge into their lives. I have to wait 24 hours before acting. Even though we're FBI, we still have to follow the laws. The phone rang as Thomas finished his thought. Toby, Marlena yelled from the kitchen. Phone! Hello, Thomas said. Then, oh my God, I'll be right there. As he hung up, he looked at his father. They found my agents. Thomas and Nate parked the car at the local hospital in D.C. and hurried into the emergency room only to find it filled with FBI agents and the local police. Thomas flashed his badge and a nurse escorted him to his two agents. Nate took a seat in the waiting room. As he peeked around a curtain, Thomas saw his agents in bed with tubes and wires hooked to monitors. He approached Marzoni 
first and gently took her hand with his. Joe? Thomas whispered very upset. Joe, are you all right? Josephia Marzoni had been thoroughly beaten. Bandages barely hid the deep cuts that covered her face. With swollen red and black eyes and thick blood-caked lips, Josephia Marzonia did not look good at all. Joe, it's Thomas. Tears rolled down Joe's swollen eyes. She tried to open them but couldn't. Shh, Thomas said. It's okay. We'll talk later. He gave her a kiss on the back of the hand, the only place that wasn't bruised or bleeding, and gently laid her hand back on the bed. He turned and stared at Agent Prowler, who looked even worse than Joe. Hey, buddy, Thomas said. How's it going? Prowler raised a hand then slowly lowered it to say he was fine. He couldn't move his lips. He had a large cut that trailed across his face from ear to ear. His bottom jaw hung at a painful angle because it had lost its muscle tone. It was obviously broken. The doctors had encased his body with an air-filled plastic bodysuit to keep blood, co blood cots from forming. Thomas's eyes filled with tears and his stomach was beginning to ache. Who in the hell did this to you? I'll get those bastards, I will, he said, fighting back tears. I'm so sorry, he whispered into Prowler's ears. I should have believed you. I guess I'm not a very good leader. I'll make it up to you somehow, I promise. As he left, Thomas turned and said to both of them, Look, you get some rest and I'll be back tomorrow. I'm really p proud of both of you. And he added jokingly, Take a few days off. They all wanted to smile, but their emotions just wouldn't cooperate. He asked a nurse, watching quietly, if a John Green had been there to see them, and she shook her head yes. Thomas found the director in the nurse's lounge along with other FBI agents and police officers. Director, what in the name of God happened to my agents? Thomas yelled. The director turned slowly from his conversation with the individual in a DC police uniform and replied, we don't know. We think it may have been a mugging, but we won't know for sure until we can question them. He took Thomas by the arm and they walked from the others to, consider, to continue their conversation. They were discovered tucked away in a dirty alley in a very bad part of town, he said calmly. He looked directly into Thomas's eyes and said in a stern voice, Thomas, we need to know why you sent them there. Thomas was surprised and angered by the ridiculous question. Unless the senator's office was in that part of town, I did not send them there. Green immediately backed off. We'll talk more tomorrow. There's nothing more any of us can do here tonight. Come see me first thing in the morning and we'll review the police reports together. Go home. Get some sleep. He paused. And Thomas, be careful. Chapter 23 Thomas was in the director's office early the next morning with his coffee and notepad. It was a little after 7 in downtown Washington, D.C. on a beautiful August morning. Birds were chirping and the air was crisp, not yet muggy from the heavy humidity that tortures the eastern states during the summer months. Fall was at least another six to eight weeks away, all being determined by the jet stream, that unpredictable flow of air from the west to the east across the United States. When the jet stream dipped, cooler weather could be, would, be in the, would be in the forecast, but when the stream rose, the hot, humid air would follow it northward. As he waited for the director, Thomas watched the traffic through the window. He wondered how much more of this he could take. Maybe his mother was right. Maybe being an executive would be a better and safer profession. Good morning, the director said from behind Thomas as he entered the room. He too had a cup of coffee and sipped it as he stood next to Thomas, who continued to watch the traffic. Thomas broke the silence. I don't know how much of this I can handle, John. I didn't send my agents anywhere. I wouldn't have sent my own kids. How you could even think that is eating me up inside. We just have to conduct a thorough investigation, Thomas. You'll be debriefed and question its procedure. He patted Thomas on the shoulder and took another sip. I sure do wish we could smoke in public buildings. I need one now. Thomas was reminded of the tour guide from Ohio who talked about people smoking in public buildings. He also remembered how excited he was to finally be handling his own case. 
But now all of that excitement was gone, replaced with an overwhelming desire for revenge for his badly beaten agents. He continued to watch the traffic as it flowed through as it followed the stoplight's command, red stop, green go, yellow, hurry up and get through before it changed colors. He thought about how our lives were controlled by simple rules and procedures that no one ever questioned but followed daily. He continued staring out the window as he spoke. Where are the reports? Here, the director walked to his desk, set down his coffee, picked up a folder and held it out to Thomas. As he glanced through the pages, something occurred to him. He looked up at the director. I'm hungry. Want a donut? What? Thomas closed the report and took another sip. Let me tell you a story, sir, but I'd like to get a donut first. Want to walk with me? He gave the director a strange look and motioned with his head at the door. Sure, I need a smoke anyway. The director and Thomas exited the elevator and headed for the street. They walked down E Street as John lit up his cigarette. He took a few puffs and looked at Thomas. Want one? No. Thought you quit. I did. Now, what do you want to talk about? I know it's not food. Something hit me in there, and I think, I just think I'm starting to put it together. They sat on a short brick wall, and Thomas told John about his disturbing conversation with Prouder. The director needed another cigarette and lit it up. Sir, I don't know for sure, but... What if, Thomas leaned over to the director and whispered, our government is somehow involved. Director Green didn't like what he was hearing. Things were going way beyond his control, and he was not sure how he was going to handle it. If he didn't do things in the right manner, all of their lives would be in serious danger. If what you say is true, John said, then we're being monitored. Nothing we say or do in that building can be properly protected. I know, sir. That's why I wanted to come out here, but I've got an idea. Thomas smiled. I'm interested. Chapter 24. Thomas studied his new surroundings. He liked them at once. I can't thank you enough, Tom. I'm excited to have you here, Toby. Maybe we'll see more of each other this way. I'll take good care of you, my friend. He patted Thomas on the shoulder. We have the latest in anti-espionage equipment installed here. No one can listen in on any of your conversations and only those with the cipher lock combination can enter. We allow you to create your own code so only you will be only you will be giving it out. If you forget it, you won't be able to get back in. Tom was obviously extremely proud of his facility's ability and excited to have the FBI housed in his complex. We're happy that you can use the contract for this purpose, Toby. Ultratrans is happy to assist you in any way we can. This will do just fine, thanks. When can we begin moving in? Today is fine with me. I'll have our security officer come by and work with you on the lock. He patted Thomas on the back again and closed the door behind him. Thomas looked around the small room and was happy. Real ceilings, not those fake drop down ones and cinder block walls. This place would protect his privacy while he continued to conduct his investigation. His cell phone didn't work while inside the room, so he stepped outside in the hall. Carrie answered on the first ring. Thomas? How'd it go? she asked anxiously. We're moving in. Gather all the stuff, and all of you get over here on the double. We're on our way. He clicked off his cell phone as the female security officer approached. Mr. Edwards, she was a rather striking tall blonde with an exquisite figure. She wore a navy blue suit with a red silk shell. Her straw-colored waist-length hair floated in the air as she walked. Yes, hello, Thomas answered. My name is Natalie Holmes. Nice to meet you. I'm to explain how to create your own code and go over the specifics of the room. She entered her key into the cipher lock and began explaining the workings to Thomas. After 40 minutes of security indoctrination, Thomas was ready for a break. But since his agents had arrived, carrying boxes full of evidence, he knew a break would be some time away. Hey, we've got everything, Carrie announced excitedly when she saw Thomas. We left absolutely nothing there. Three agents were trying to sign in while balancing their boxes. 
Thomas waited patiently, then escorted them to their new quarters. This is great, Carrie said, looking around. Yeah, this will do just fine, Agent Snyder agreed, grinning. The agents began arranging their evidence on the walls and dumping information into the computers provided by Ultratans. Thomas felt safe and secure in his new surroundings. This was Ultratrans field office in Alexandria, only a short distance from the FBI headquarters. He had known the district manager for many years, and Ultratrans was one of the FBI's top contractors, so Thomas felt he could trust them completely. After lunch, the agents settled down to discuss and analyze their findings. Thomas gave each agent the combination to the room and reemphasized the importance of complete security and the confidentiality of everything that would occur over the next few months. They all agreed as well on a location for a safe place in case they ever felt in danger. Carrie handed Thomas a United States Post Office overnight package. I ran back to headquarters and checked our boxes. Here's the preliminary autopsy report on the senator. Came in today. Oh, and this came in the mail, too. What the hell is a preliminary autopsy report, Thomas asked. Don't know, but that's what's stamped on it. He grabbed the material from her and looked cautiously at the preliminary autopsy report. Hey, don't be so rude, she snapped. He ignored her, frowning at the report. This is nothing but a glance at the body and an educated guess, useless to us. He tossed it across the table. But this, the overnight package from Prowler and Joe, he anxiously pulled out the content. Carrie picked up the preliminary autopsy report and read through it. Hey, it's not totally useless, she snickered. At least it confirms he's dead. All eyes rolled at Carrie as Agent Owens asked, What's in the other package, Thomas? Thomas explained about the conversation he'd had with Prowler the previous day. Although she had heard one side while sitting in the car, Carrie was anxious to hear the whole story. Thomas spread the contents of the envelope on the table. Detailed reports signed by Prowler as well as photocopies of different material were anxiously read by each agent. The first report Thomas picked up was an account of what happened when Prowler and Joe followed the paper trail to the Pentagon. It seemed that the work order for the temporary help had originated in Division 275. But, Prowler noted, there was no Division 275 anywhere in the Pentagon. Also, when the agents started asking questions, one individual in particular, a Mr. Davidson from security, told them it would be wise if they didn't ask any more questions and to leave at once. Thomas made a note to talk personally to this Mr. Davidson. A copy of the work order and a few other materials showing exactly which departments the two agents had visited were spread out on the table, along with Prowler's handwritten notes. Thomas gathered the material and motioned to Carrie. Come on, we're going to retrace their steps. Now we're talking, she yelped. Owen and Snyder wanted to stay behind and continue digesting all the information.